Lecture thirty. I want to say one other thing、uh, by way of preface, if I can have all your attention now, please. We had an incident occur up in Salt Lake here just the other night that demonstrates a real challenge to you.、Uh, they had a traffic jam up there on one of our main streets that borders one of the outdoor theaters. And it's perfectly understandable why there was a tra- traffic jam here, right out in front of、uh, the whole neighborhood. They had one of the roughest X films that has been produced, and it went on all kinds of depravity, nudity, and so forth, all portrayed on the screen. The kind of things that would have sent those people to prison for 15 years, just 10 years ago. But as a result of Supreme Court rulings that has opened it wide up to permissiveness. We have people who, for a, a dirty dollar, will do anything. So it was being done, and on the screen, and in public, and the police just couldn't clear the highway. They'd get one traffic jam unjammed, and the next one would come. This thing turned out to be a public nuisance. And good people too would stop and say, "For heaven's sake!" So that's what an X-rated movie is. I mean,、uh, everybody just stop in absolute astonishment. So、um, it's created a real furor up in Salt Lake. A lot of letters are being written, and and probably something worthwhile will grow out of it all. But this is the thing that impresses me. This is your generation. I didn't have to put up with this when I was going through that real rough period of multiple temptations, which are all around you. Which you're you're confused, you're curious,、uh, you want to be、uh, with it, and so forth. Yet you want to keep everything under control, and that's what. Lucifer exploits our curiosity and so forth, and we all had to go through it. But the thing is geared up awfully high and hard for your generation. So, what the Nephites fell into, Lucifer wants you to fall into. This is your generation. You're going right into the Sodom and Gomorrah epic. It has arrived. It isn't coming. It has arrived. And immorality and drugs are his favorite techniques. Criminal activity is number three. So that's your challenge. Your moms and dads, your teachers, your bishops—nobody can help you when you're alone and making that decision. You've just got to be close to the Lord and say, "Satan, you devil, you get behind me, and don't push. Just get behind me and stay back there. Keep him back of you." Don't let him snare you, because we're having a real problem in the church right now. It's having its impact. There's no doubt about it. Our number one problem in the church today with our young people is immorality. And our stake presidency called us and the high council together in our stake, and they had been told by the brethren to immediately start a survey and see how we're doing. And they were just absolutely shocked to find how extensive the problem had become, become, become with no one quite realizing it. Now, one of the things we're finding out is that it isn't the presence of the temptation that necessarily、um, trips us. As a matter of fact, in areas like Las Vegas and Reno, where the thing is brazen and flagrant, and、uh, it's Sodom and Gomorrah and advertised as such, the young people、uh, grit their teeth and say,、uh, "We won't have any part of it." Can hardly wait to get their hands on the slots and. Gee, what's what? Am, what am I missing? You know, that kind of an attitude toward、uh, Las Vegas. So our young people out of Utah and Idaho, and California, are the ones that the authorities in Las Vegas, the church authorities, have trouble with, the visitors. Whereas most of their young people, with some exceptions, obviously, the local young people grit their teeth and set their faces like flint and say, they can have it. Now that's the only way to get through this thing. Don't let your curiosity take you into the lion's den where you can be beat, be bitten. Anyway, we're moving in, and、uh, and the brethren,、uh, all they can do is to warn us and counsel us and help us and love us and do what they can. You still have to decide whether you want the celestial, the terrestrial, or the telestial kingdom. And Lucifer has all his hurdles all set up for you. So that's why we're reading this book. This book was to help us get through. And I know most of you are making it. I'm proud of you, but a few of you are not. And、uh, we just want you to make it. Get back. Get back. A few aren't making it. And our 
Our success pattern is so much better than elsewhere, but our casualty pattern is so much greater than it used to be. So I just say to you, you know I don't, wherever you are, do what you have to do to straighten it out. And of course, once we've violated the moral code, we must then go through priesthood channels to cleanse the record, and that's to go directly to the bishop, who is a judge in Israel, and he works out the program for us. There is a point of no return. We need to recognize that, too, where uh, very severe action has to be taken, and, and it takes a long time, if ever, to work back. But our Heavenly Father loves us, and his whole program is constructive, not destructive. Now, this is the problem that Helaman had, then his son Nephi and Lehi have. And they see all these wonderful people. They were in the church. They were praying day and night. They were devoted and so forth. And like that, they went out the window. And all of a sudden, they're gone. They're the enemies of the kingdom. The very ones that were so strong are now the enemies of the kingdom. So that, that is the point where we find... Um, Nephi, young Nephi, he's only 21 or 22, he becomes chief, he's president of the church and he's chief judge. The people uh, at least have enough sense not to trust any ordinary people to be chief judge. Helaman was so much better than the other uh, families that they were using, so they decide to make Helaman the chief judge after Pecumenai was killed, and therefore they automatically elect Nephi, just in his early 20s. And it's just right after that that the whole thing breaks loose. They get dissent. They start to get quarreling. Young Nephi is trying to handle the civil law, and he's trying to handle the presidency of the church. There's a tremendous wave of apostasy everywhere. A bunch of the um, Nephites become so rebellious, uh, they start a little pattern of civil war, and, and Moroniah has to go down to take care of them, and they go rapidly over in the wilderness and try to get the Lamanites to come over and attack. Did the Lamanites come? No, they were too scared. Then another dissident group went over and said, oh boy, they're right. They are just fractionalizing right and left. They're not listening to either the chief judge or the president of the church. Go, go, man, this is the time. Did they come this time? Yeah, this time they came. And how they came. And you see apostate Nephites uh, cased the situation for them, said, here's where you hit them. And poor Moroniha, he found those Nephites just collapsing like straws in the wind. And he finally was able to hold the line, but where? Where? Clear up and bountiful. Then he did a peculiar thing. Here they are all in bountiful. They fled from Zarahemla and Gideon and all those cities. Nephi has gone. Moroni has gone. Uh, Lehi has gone. Morianton, Omner, Gid. Uh, Mulek is gone. Everything's been taken. And here's his army and his people all ganged up against the little narrow neck of the funnel going up into the isthmus toward the land northward, and he takes his troops and goes back of the people and fortifies it from where to where? From sea to sea. How do you account for that? What's the idea of having your people here in Bountiful? Oh, he left some protection in front of them, no doubt. But he went back and defended behind them. What's that strategy mean? In other words, that's their escape valve. And he's got to be in a position to hold the Lamanites. If they have to flee through that pass, we fortify the pass, you see? That's, that's the strategy. In other words, we're going to hold Bountiful if we can. If we can't, brother, we'd better be able to hold them at the narrow neck of land, which was much easier to defend. But the Lamanites, for the time being, they were kind of digesting their spoils. It was beautiful. Oh, that was wonderful. And their Zoramite leaders were so jubilant over their success. So it gave um, Moroni a chance. Now, he's been a general for 30 years. He's the number one prestige man. He's the hero of many wars. And he looks at these two youngsters, uh, barely returned missionaries, Nephi and Lehi. He's president of the church and chief judge. But they're just boys, really. They don't have any prestige. Nobody's listening to them really much. And so who uh, went out to preach the gospel with them? General or Captain Moranaiha? Did the people listen respectfully? Did they have some degree of success? Why, Moranaiha was so, Im so pleased, he says, I think we can take them now. We're beginning to get a little morality again. We're getting, getting a little um, character back in our people. Let's uh, mobilize on Monday morning here and see if we can't retake a couple of cities. Did, were they successful? In fact, they took how much of the land back? Did it include Zarahemla? No, they didn't make Zarahemla. 
Now, that gave them some breathing space. So Nephi says, okay, obviously this is the way to solve our problems. I can't do anything as chief judge anyway. I'll turn it over to somebody else and really concentrate on a missionary campaign. He turned it over to whom? Who? What did you say? You sure now? Okay, Cizorum. It's a C, and in the book it's a Z, corrected. It's a typo. Ciesrum? No, Oh, yes, we're coming up to Ciantum and... Yes, uh-huh, one's the Gadianton chief judge and... I don't recall, was there anything mentioned about the city of Melech and the Lamech? Uh, d down here? Yeah, the people of... Yeah, they took everything. That, uh, of course, a lot of the people of Ammon had gone. Where did they go? Yeah, practically all of them have gone to Plan Northward, so we got a different picture there. And um, so he, he turned it over to Cesorum. Cesorum becomes the chief judge. He doesn't know he's going to be assassinated, his son too, but anyway, that's for the future. And um, Nephi finally I started out. Now, where, did, where was their first missionary effort? Where did they start out? In Bountiful. Then where did they go? And they moved over to what city? Did I get away from you? Yeah, good. And then where'd they go? See, it was just a little circuit. See, the great thing about, uh, about knowing your map is that Gid will appear in your book, um, and uh, you look around at an ordinary Sunday school class, they have no idea where we are. They don't know whether Nephi's down near Zarahemla, or they don't know where he is. They don't know he's over on the beach, just below Mulek and just above Omner, you see. So you have a duty to straighten them out. Very modestly, but straighten them out. See. Might mention that Gid was on the seashore there, just below Mulek and just above Omner. <laughs> That's the city where the Nephites were rescued from, you'll remember, by Captain Moroni, where they lowered all of the weapons into the city. <laughs> okay? So they, they went from Bountiful to Gid to Mulek and back to Bountiful, and now they've had quite a bit of success. Moroni says, um, actually, I can't... Uh, we can't get enough righteousness to really recover the whole land. I've just about done everything that we can do militarily until the people repent. And that's why Nephi had resigned as chief judge and gone the spiritual route to rejuvenate the people. Now he's so successful among the Nephites. They haven't all joined the church, but that thing is going. He's got some people ordained helping him out. The thing to do is to take the Lord's war to the enemy. So down he goes to a suicide, on a suicide mission to Zarahemla with his brother Lehi. And, of course, there are a lot of dissident Nephites. It's nothing to have a Nephite walking up and down the streets. So they don't attract much attention. They get a chance to be heard, and, and the Lamanites, they're willing to listen and so forth. And pretty soon some of the Nephites do what? The dissident Nephites. They come back. Now, the Lamanites were easily led. The, the, the Lamanite personality of, of that day, you'll notice this is characteristic. As a matter of fact, Lehi said, you're not going to be blamed for a lot of your sins because it's the traditions of your fathers. They're, they they emphasize easily. They have a almost a childlike faith and confidence. They make wonderful members of the church when they're converted, and uh, tremendous capacity to hang on. But if they're misled, they 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 have a tendency to um, to go as a group. Uh, they convert as a group. They go as a group. Now, Ephraim is not that way. He's a very stubborn, independent. He's hard to, harder to work with, actually. He really is. An Ephraimite's much harder to work with than the, than the tribe of Manasseh. And we're finding that out in the kingdom. And it was our ancestors that led ten tribes bring off in the wilderness. We, we have to constantly remind ourselves about the, being like little children. This almost comes naturally to all of our Lamanite brethren. And uh, so they were actually under the leadership of the Zoramites. And when some of the Nephites began to be converted and to say to the Lamanites, uh, you know, we actually were wrong. You were? You get an immediate reaction. How many were baptized in Zarahemla? How many? Isn't that fantastic? 8,000 were baptized. Now Nephi says to his brother Lehi, you willing to go all the way? How about Nephi? Let's go to enemy headquarters. Now that took a lot of courage because we have no indication they were commanded to go there. They just said, we've got the gospel, we owe it to our brethren, we're going to take it. Okay? I remember I was a question about, you said Lehi... Now, Lehi was from Manasseh. 
Ishmael is from Ephraim. So they're a mixture. But the dominant blood is Manasseh, the dominant. See, there's some Judah mixed in through the Mulekites too. So our American Indians carry all three bloodlines. But Manasseh is dominant. Most of them, who, when they get their patriarchal blessings, are to get their blessings through Manasseh. Well, more Manasseh. Well, most of them get their their blessings in that that route. Now, as we're converting the Japanese and some of the Polynesians and some of those in in Hong Kong and Taiwan, it's kind of a mixture. It's Manasseh and Ephraim. And in one family, uh, Indian family, you'll sometimes have uh, have the patriarch say, well, uh, two children are of Ephraim and three children are of Manasseh." It's mixed right in one family. Sometimes you'll have both parents, Ephraim, and the child will be Manasseh. Sometimes you have both parents, Manasseh, and a child will be Ephraim. It's real interesting. Actually, the bloodlines are mixed. All the patriarch is doing is signifying the line through which their blessings come and the role that they are to play, because each tribe has different roles. Just what, Joseph? Yeah, sometimes that will happen, and that's as much as you know. You don't know which, then you don't know which descendant of Joseph you come through. Um, all right, now he gets down there and immediately he's thrown into prison. And a hundred years earlier, if Ammon, bless his heart, had had any idea what was going to happen in that miserable prison he was thrown into, he would have kind of thrilled in anticipation. As he looked around the walls and knew that one day they would shake and tremble into the power of God's hand and the Holy Ghost would be manifest in Pentecostal power that with such uh, strength and, and magnificence, that it would convert the whole Lamanite nation practically. Wouldn't that have been a thrill to know a hundred years before it happened? Because that's where Lehi and Nephi were thrown, wasn't it? Right in that same prison in the city of Nephi that Ammon a hundred years earlier had been thrown when he came down out of Zarahemla to rescue the lost uh, Nephites under King Limhi. And King Limhi thought that he was a priest of King Noah, threw him into jail, uh, held him incommunicado, and they brought him out the next day and Limhi uh, and uh, Ammon said, if you knew who I was, you'd have never thrown me in prison that way. I came as your friend from Zarahemla to see what we could do to help you. Aha, uh -huh, there are no people in Zarahemla. We have already been up there. You are lying. They're all dead. We've been there. No, you haven't been there. We're still very much alive. But we saw all cities loaded with dead people, bones and what have you. Oh, you missed us. You got up among the Jaredites. You missed us. They were killed off a hundred years before that or more. So then Limhi was very happy. Now that's what it's talking about. That's the prison that Lehi and Nephi suddenly found themselves in. Now the technique of the Lamanites, after all, this was the military headquarters. They were much more security conscious there. You have two Nephites walk in without shaved heads. Mm, enemy. They approach them. Are they enemy? Yeah, they're from the enemy ranks. No doubt about it. They're certainly not converted, or shall we say, apostate Nephites by any manner of means. So they throw them in prison. They immediately subjected them to what? Starvation. Give them a little water maybe, but no food. Now, you're, no, you're only good for about 12 days. And you go into uh, delirium and uh, terrible things. The stomach becomes distended. The brain goes into fever, um, uh, a feverish, um, illusionary... Um, psychedelic dreams and so forth. It's a terrible experience to starve to death. It's a very cruel way to die. And these men are going to be starved down to the point where there's nothing left and in their anemic and emaciated condition they're going to be killed. And 300 of the top officials wanted to see the president of the church killed and his brother. So they gathered together. Were there Lamanites? And what were the rest of them? Apparently, the, most of them were Zoramites because when Amalekiah became king, he apparently had pushed in a tremendous quantity of Zoramites into high positions. Forty-four years earlier, many of these people who were in this prison when they were younger men had been responsible for stoning Alma's son Shiblon. They had rejected the poor. They had done all of their prayers from the high prayer tower called... Isn't that great? See, you know it. Ramiumptum. And uh, they had then participated in a war to annihilate and avenge themselves on those who had become Christians out of their midst. That's who these people are. Now, God is not allowed to do anything unjust. What happens to him if he does? He would cease to be God. 42nd chapter of the book of Alma. 
Therefore, everything that he does do is justified under the circumstances. And this tells us something about these people. That in the first estate, they must have earned a magnificent blessing that they are now allowed to enjoy like Alma the Younger. Because God cannot take a person who is a reprobate totally, completely, and treat him with a special blessing like these men received, even though part of their existence in the second estate has been pretty bad. There was something there to justify God doing to these people what he did do. And when we have the whole panorama of history spread out before our eyes, we will see some probably magnificent people among these very wicked Zoramites that had no idea what great people they'd been in the pre-existence. For example, you just stop for a moment. You see, you don't know who you are. Don't any of you know who you are? I don't know who I am. When Joseph Smith was told who he was in the pre-existence, he didn't dare tell the saints, lest it be a, be a test of their faith. So he never did tell them. But he had been—he he was told who he was in the pre-existence and what role he played there. And he never, never shared that with the saints. But he did tell them that his, he had been allowed to, to know his pre-existence. Now, um, uh, the angel Gabriel turned out to be Noah, and, and uh, uh, Michael turned out to be Adam, and so forth. These are great people. So as you see something marvelous happening to these Zoramites, don't think that the Lord just plucks up somebody who is a terrible reprobate and, and does as Augustine does, says, uh, touches them on the brow just to prove to himself that he can save them. God is not arbitrary. So whenever he does anything like this, the background justified it. Otherwise, God would cease to be God. Just kind of keep that in mind as you watch this happening. So here are these individuals, and all of a sudden... They've come in to kill these poor emaciated men, and uh, uh, they can't get at them. What happened? Fire! Fantastic! And you can imagine Lehi and Nephi, see, they thought they were going to be martyrs. You can tell the way they handled it. They thought they, well, you know, some seal their blood, seal their testimony with their blood. All of a sudden, fire! They're not going to kill us. God's not going to let them. So they struggled to their feet. What did they say to the to these these uh, statesmen? God is doing this, so you will not kill us. Repent, repent. They're probably so weak they could probably hardly speak. In uh, the third thousand years, um, yeah, in the third thousand years, I put in the writings of my friend John Noble, who was almost starved to death in a, uh, in a um, Russian prisoner of war camp. And he went through all 12 days. Half the camp died before he got an ounce of bread. At the end of 12 days, he got an ounce of bread. Each day he was given a little bit of water. But both he and his father survived, but half the camp died. And he described what it was like to go through that terrible experience and what, what it does to your body and the paralysis that set in and the tremors that take over. And he watched himself as his body deteriorated, getting ready to die. It's a real interesting experience. These men went through that. So they pleaded with these men. Uh, this is God's power being manifest. They took courage. And then what happened? What hit next? We get some darkness first? How about a little darkness? Boy, when that darkness hit... No fire at all scared the wits out of these 300 men because it was a very strange kind of darkness. It is so damp and so thick, you can feel it. You can't light a fire in it, and if there has been a fire, the smoke will kill you. Now, this will happen uh, in the Great Destruction here a little later on. The smoke will kill you because it's that thick. <clears throat> Furthermore, it so frightens everybody, you feel around. Joe, is that you? That's me. What's happened? I don't know. What do we do? I don't know. They're just paralyzed. So all of a sudden, what started happening to the ground? Mm. And if you've never been in an earthquake, you don't know what it's like to... You, you can't understand it until you've been in one. You start to move toward a door and it keeps moving. Can't get it open, it's jammed. You're trapped. Everything's falling off the walls and, and darkness and everything is roaring and rattling. It just scares the wits out of you. Especially if you're in Los Angeles and you see skyscrapers swaying. It gives you a funny feeling. All the facing blocks falling off in the streets and killing anybody that's foolish enough to run outside. Anyway, uh, then they heard a voice, and it was a soft, sweet voice. 
And it told them that they were to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. It seemed like the voice was coming from up above them. They look up there, it's still dark. And then after the voice speaks, what do they get? Sound effects, you see. More more earthquake. And then they hear it a second time, earthquake. They hear it a third time, earthquake. And uh, they're just absolutely panic-stricken because they know this stone building or whatever it was they were in is about to come down over their heads. And then a man who is a former Christian, he's an apostate member of the Christian church who had joined the Zoramites, got himself turned around so he looks toward Lehi and Nephi and lo and behold he saw something amazing. What was it? In the darkness, what did he see? Their faces are radiant in the darkness. Now this man's name is easy to remember. We have some... Uh, a dab of something, big dab of something. That's a big dab of something. This is a little dab of something. That's a very little dab of something. And this man was a mini dab. <laughs> right? He was a little dab, just a little tiny dab. You want to try and remember who the man was that uh, was the con the Christian that con that got all those people organized and so forth. Just remember, he was not a big dab. He was a little mini dab. Okay. Aminadab, that's his name. That's the only way you'll, that I've ever been able to remember that name. And I'll hear teachers say, and there was a man there, and uh, he said to the, to the Lamanites and the Zoramites, we ought to start praying, and you're able to hold up your hand and say, you mean Aminadab? Aminadab. Yeah, I never can remember that name. Well, he wasn't a big dab, he was Aminadab. That's the way you remember. Okay? Now you got that one. We're going to... Uh, Memorize um, Siezrum the same way in just a minute by a little special association. Anyway, he says to them, you want to know how to get rid of this darkness? They were scared to death. What do you do? He, he got them all to look at uh, Nephi and they seemed to be talking to somebody. What do we do about this darkness? How do you get rid of it? Remember back when we were taught by who? Alma. Amulek. Siezrum. Where? Where? In Antionum, back where the Zoramites were rebelling, on the mission of Alma the Younger. Remember when he said, believe on Christ? Now, let us pray this darkness away. Play, pray to Jesus Christ. And did these frightened Zoramites pray? Oh, like they'd never prayed before. They cried out into the voice that was talking to them and pleaded that the darkness be suspended. And as they threw themselves on the mercy of Christ and acknowledged the fact that he was their leader, all of a sudden the darkness disintegrated and what replaced it? Fire. And now Nephi and Lehi are surrounded by fire once more. Not just their faces, their whole bodies. And they look around themselves, what are they surrounded by? The Zoramites. They're surrounded by fire. This is how we know the majority of these people were Zoramites brought in by Malachi and the other Zoramite kings and a few Lamanites here and there, but mostly being led by Zoramites. Now, notice what happens to the Lamanites. As soon as these men go out to the Lamanites and say, you should have seen what happened to us. What happened? We've been wrong. You have? Yes. Everything we've been telling you is a lie. It was? Yes. And we're doing some very wicked things. We are? Yes. <laughs> what do we do about it? We've got to be baptized. You mean like Nephites? Yes, they were right and we were wrong. Oh. We want to be baptized. Yes, we'll be baptized. Well, then what do we do about the Nephites? We've got to stop hating them. Oh, we should? All right. We've just got to stop fighting them. All right, we'll stop fighting them. But gee, we got all their land. We better give it back to them. All right, we will. Now, the Lamanites went just like that and made marvelous converts. And you can imagine how Moraniah must have felt. Here he's up, hasn't heard much from Lehi and... And Nephi, and he's up there in Bountiful. All of a sudden, the word comes up. The Lamanites are evacuating the capital city. They are? Yes, they're all leaving. What happened? They joined the church. <laughs> they're all going home. Fantastic. Fantastic. So Moraniah, they all went down, reoccupied their territory. Now a marvelous thing happened. The Lamanites came down and said to the Nephites, those that were wicked, we saw the power of God manifest. Cleave unto the kingdom, and you will not regret it. And they, the missionary work continued, and finally these Lamanites said, Look, we got lots of work to do up in the land northward. Let's go up. And the president of the church said, 
I'll go with you. And his brother said, and I'll go with you. And so up they went in the year 29 B.C., disappeared for six years, and went over the whole land northward, and what was that land cursed with? Gadiantons. Gadiantons. Uh, that was the thing that turned out to be too, too strong for them. There was a brief period, however, before they, the Gadiantons gained control. And Mormon says that during a year or two, there began to be wonderful commerce up and down the land northward and the land southward before the Gadians began taking advantage of the commerce which they thrive on. And it says as a result, the Nephites found that the Lamanites made wonderful leather purses or something, and uh, the Lamanites found that they could uh, sell their goods for gain. And the Lamanites in turn wanted to buy some of the Nephite goods for gain. The, the Lamanites began raising good grain, etc. All of a sudden you got people packing things up and down the land and selling it to each other. Do you know what that produces? Wealth, prosperity. That's what made America great. We got commerce all across this land. You don't have to stop when you go down to Arizona and uh, they won't let you go down there to sell uh, a suit of clothes. They can't stop you. Interferes with interstate commerce. The only time they can stop you is when you may have diseased fruit or something. They can stop, stop for that purpose. All right, now I want you to notice the words that this was done to get gain. Now, you belong to a generation, and I did too, where there were a lot of propagandists who were e economics majors that tried to say that if you do anything to get gain, it's very wicked, it's very bad. And so we developed an attitude of anybody who makes a profit is a bad man. All these people are making a profit. Is that bad? I put this in your book, but you may have missed it. I gave you a definition of the word profit. And if you remember it, it will help you understand why the Lord and why the Founding Fathers said that this profit motive must be kept alive. There is such a thing as gouging and improper motives like uh, profit, like anything else. But there is a right principle that's lost very frequently by some nations and they wonder why their production disappears. All right. Profit is the price you pay for something you want you won't otherwise get. That's all profit is. Now, as I say, it can be an unreasonable profit and an unfair profit, but that's another problem. So will you write that down? Because you might just be asked what, what the definition of profit is. It's the price you pay for something you want you won't otherwise get. Now let me illustrate it. In January, they plant watermelon in Yuma Valley. And by February and March, they've got watermelon. By July, they've got watermelon rotting in the fields, stacked so high you couldn't sell a watermelon in Yuma Valley at any price under ordinary circumstances. Now, in Utah in July, we get our 90 to 100 degree heat. And that's what reminds us that this used to be a desert. We get it in July, sometimes the latter part of June. And do you know what you'd pay an awful lot for in July in Utah? Ice cold watermelon. I don't know when it started, but many years ago, some good lady, Rebecca probably, said to her husband, Henry, I hear up in Utah they want watermelons real bad. And Henry said, so what? She said, so we got them out in the fields and within two weeks they're all going to be rotten and, and spoiled. You can't sell them around here. I suggest you do something about it. She said, well, that's 700 miles away. Right, but there are Hertz trucks. Go down and rent a Hertz truck. Drive all night so they won't spoil and get them up to the good people of Utah. They deserve some of our nice watermelon. Now, we've planted watermelon, you see. They'll be ripe about the same time the squash comes through. It's gone cold again. Our local watermelons barely get in in season because we go cold. We go cool here in August. We don't need watermelons in August, latter part of August. We want them in July. So he gets in his truck. He loads them up. He gets up here and, and to see what the market will endure. You know what you can get per pound up here? You can't get hardly a half cent in Yuma. Nobody wants to buy watermelon down there. What can you get in Utah? Ten cents every year. Ten cents a pound for watermelons about to rot. 
boy, he, 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 what's this? This is about a thousand percent profit. Was it worthwhile? Oh, boy, he went home. He paid for the new roof. He paid for his wife's fur coat, which she didn't need, but she wanted it, so she got it. He paid off a doctor bill. Johnny's going to be able to go to college. Man, load the truck. We drive up again. Now, somebody else heard about it, the Women's Auxiliary at Church or something, and there are three other trucks up here. So this time, he only gets eight cents a, a pound. And the, the third time he comes up, it's down to six, then it goes down to five, then it goes down to four, that's, uh, then it goes down to three. Gee, that's only 100% profit. That's tough. Uh, but anyway, uh, it keeps going down and down as we get more watermelon. And finally, it doesn't really pay to come anymore because it's coming in from elsewhere. It's being shipped in by whole train loads. So... That's the end of that. But man, what a season. We cleaned out the fields. And boy, we'll remember this next year. Now, he came up here with those watermelon to get gain. I want to ask you, did we gain? Did we gain? Brother, I'll tell you, we looked in our pocket and pulled out a dime. We were thirsty. Was that worth a pound of watermelon? Oh, at least, at least, at least. Do you want a quarter for it? I'll pay a quarter. I've got to have some watermelon. Now, so this was very profitable to him, and it was certainly profitable to us. Now, that's the whole basis of the economic free enterprise system. And if you are disciplined so that you don't gouge during a time of shortage, which some people can't resist, or if you have a blind horse, or an automobile that you have to put uh, sawdust in the transmission to get it sold, that's just plain crookedness. But everything else being equal, the competitive system allows everybody to gain. Now, that's all I want you to remember. When it says, and they traded to get gain, both sides gain. Now, when I was over in Yugoslavia, I said, I want to buy a tube of toothpaste. Toothpaste? We have no toothpaste. I said, don't you like toothpaste? Yes, you got some to sell? No, I'm trying to buy some toothpaste. Well, it's not allowed. Why not? The government doesn't permit it. Why? Because it takes soap and other uh, commodities that ingredients that are not permitted to be made into toothpaste. It's not considered by the government to be desirable. I said, but gee, you can make a, you can mix it in an ice cream freezer. I mean, it isn't complicated. You just put it in tubes and sell it. Yeah, we'd love to do it, but not allowed. Now, you see, that's the difference. If you have the government saying it's not allowed, then you don't get it. If you will let the people go, they will go where the market is. That's why the Lamanites found they could sell up north. The Nephites found they could sell some things to the Lamanites. As a result, what? Everybody prospered. And if you know what to do with your money after you've gathered it, then the Lord can bless you. You pay your tithes, you send your children to the BYU, and otherwise, just great.